We have uh, Dr. Stephen Kapler uh, speaking next. Uh, he is a gr uh, graduate from Tufts University of Medicine, then did internal medicine and GI here at Beth Israel. Uh, he served uh, uh, with Helen Shields as a teaching fellow and is actually still involved uh, in the course, uh, giving lectures uh, at the medical school. And he is uh, uh, currently in private practice in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So, Dr. Kapler. Do you know where my presentation is? Of course I do. So we just hit escape. And we can close this. And I was just thinking about the story about, about your son, and my son recently said to me, Dad, I either want to be a circus performer or a farmer. And I never thought I'd want him to be a farmer so badly. But, uh, you know. So my, you know, I'm coming at this from the, uh, the perspective of a young person. I've been in private practice for only four years now. So I was sort of recently in your shoes. And I was at Beth Israel Deaconess, which is, you know, a more of an academic training program. And there really was no system in which for me to get any type of advice for a career as either clinician educator in a semi-private practice job or in a pure private practice job. And of course, being at an academic hospital, being involved in teaching, I had this fantasy of carrying that on as a professional career, being a clinician educator. It sounds so sexy. But the problem with that is that nobody will pay you to teach. You know, as, as Chum was saying, you really need to protect your time by getting funding. And that's even as an educator. So when I got offered a faculty position at a salary less than uh, a hospitalist would make, I felt that, you know, probably this might not be the right path for me. And I think the, um, the important thing in thinking about a career in general, probably this applies to anything, but, you know, particularly in private practice versus academic, uh, I think you need to think about what, what your priorities are. What's the most important thing to you? And a lot of this actually is the same thought process you go through uh, in the academic world. And I think career versus family, I don't think you have to give up on either. But I think there are certain times in life where you need to decide, you need to make a choice and is something better for your career or better for your family? And sometimes you may pick one way and sometimes the other, but I think in determining where you're going to end up for your career, you, you need to take into account your family. And I think a lot of people in GI fellowship are of the age where you're either in a steady relationship, married, and you may even have children. So th those are important things to consider. Prestige and recognition, I think you can really get that both ways. I mean, there's prestige at being at a Harvard you know, academic institution, but then there's also the prestige and recognition you get in a small community of being a great doctor, providing excellent care to your patients and building a reputation that way. Money, I think, you know, you, you'd like to think that money doesn't matter, but money's incredibly important. And I think for me it was even more important because my wife is a social worker who works a few hours a week. So it was um, very important that I provide an income that could support the family. Uh, I think location is another thing that shouldn't determine the actual job you take, but again, in thinking about the future, you may be happy in one area for three to five years, but eventually if you want to have children, you want to think about school systems and being near family and things like that. So what, what is private practice? I mean, I'm not sure I really even knew what that meant when I was in fellowship. I just knew it meant that you didn't work at a big hospital. And I still am not sure I know exactly what it means, other than that I, I think the best definition is that you're working in a practice that's owned by either you know yourself or a group of physicians. And so that would be your traditional solo practice or single specialty GI group. But I think when people consider coming out of fellowship, when you consider sort of private practice, I think that you lump in there other not really private practice models, but non-academic models. And those include groups where you may do GI and internal medicine. I think those are sort of disappearing now with the ABI, uh, ABIM uh, requiring recertification every 10 years. But uh, there are some groups that do that. Then there's multi-specialty groups where you really are salaried, but you're working with a group of maybe cardiologists, primary care docs, endocrine, ID. Uh, and then there's hospital-employed physicians where 
it's really not private practice at all, but you're not academic. You may be hired by a small community hospital to fulfill a need for the community. There are, I've seen advertised a few positions for GI hospitals, both I think academic positions as well as large groups that have just decided to hire someone to cover inpatient services. And I think in, in the process of, uh, of going through the job search and your thought, and your, your thinking about your career path, you also want to keep in mind the availability of an endoscopy center or an ambulatory surgical center, which can allow you to practice in a really nice environment and for doing the same amount of work can actually give you some extra income. So I was trying to list some of the advantages and disadvantages of private practice, but I think everything is, is really in how you approach it. And overall, what I like about my job and you know, my private practice is I feel as though I'm my own boss, because I am. And so I can do whatever I want. As long as I work enough and bring in enough money to pay the bills, I can work as much or as little as I want. I actually, I work four days a week, so I have Wednesday off because I thought it'd be too hard to work more than two days in a row without a day off. So I just decided to do <laughs> Wednesday off, and I, you know, I get to sp uh, bring my son to the school bus, pick him up from the school bus, take care of my daughter while my wife works a little bit, and it's probably my hardest day of the week, but <laughs> the most, you know, the most enjoyable. Um, and income, as I, uh, as I talked about, I mean, and I'll go through this in a little more detail in terms of compensation, but you certainly will make more in a clinical GI job in private practice than you will in just about any academic job. What are the disadvantages? I mean, the, the biggest disadvantage is you don't have fellows to do your work. And that is really disappointing to me. I mean, I wish I had someone to cover my beeper, someone to do my clinic notes, field the phone calls from patients, but, but I don't. I actually do that myself. Um, you typically will have more call uh, but the call is often less rigorous because you're covering a smaller uh, patient population. So my practice, we have four doctors and we share with another GI doc. So we're on, it's not really every fifth night, but it's, you know, three weeknights a month and almost a weekend a month. It, it is a less academic environment, which that, that's probably my biggest disappointment. I mean, I really, I do miss the academic environment. We have grand rounds, but they hold things, uh, in the community, they hold things at later times because people, they don't get up early, I found. It's strange. I mean, Grand Rounds will be at like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. So it's really in the middle of your work day, especially if you do endoscopy. Typically, endoscopy starts early in the morning. Um, and, you know, we don't have GI surgery conferences and things like that that are intellectually very, very stimulating. Lonely is, is something that I never imagined. I always thought, when you go into private practice, you, you join a group and you're working with these colleagues and you discuss cases and you, know, you, you manage the practice together. And while that's true and I do that, I've, I've found that you're often working on different schedules because if I'm in the office, my partners may be in endoscopy or vice versa. So you know, we don't overlap as much as I think I would, you know, I, as I would like to. Um, so that's one, you know, one difference maybe of private practice versus academic. There's just less people or, or less colleagues around you certainly interact with a ton of, of other people. Um, there's no income guarantee. So if you're someone who needs to make X amount a month or a year and you just you feel better knowing that you're always going to make that no matter what, you know, private practice is a little riskier, although I think in this day and age, even academic position salaries may change. So private practice, you know, there's a lot of different structures out there, um, but I think in general, I'm just going to highlight some of the, the basics. Most private practice jobs, when you join, you'll be an employee for the first one to two years. I think in this region, it's typically two years. So what happens is that for those first two years, it, it essentially is a salary position where you're guaranteed a certain income, you have all your, you know, benefits covered, and that's really to allow you to get, get on your feet, build your patient population, and cover your expenses. Because if you, let's say, went out and did uh, uh, your own private practice, you just started from scratch, you'd need to take out a large loan to rent office space, hire a secretary, you know, get electronic medical records, and you'd have operating expenses expenses from day one, 
with no you know, payments coming in for at least you know, 30 to 45 days. So it, w w the other nice thing about it is it gives you and the partners sort of a trial period. So in this region, and I think this is different in maybe, other in re maybe in other regions, but also I think different in other specialties. But in our region, I think it's pretty standard that if a practice hires you, you typically will be offered partnership, assuming you do a great job, you get along with the partners, the, the community likes you. I think that's pretty, pretty standard that you'll get offered partnership. So what does that mean? I mean, typically what that means is that you will then have an opportunity to purchase shares in a business or to purchase part of that business. And it's usually divided equally. So if there's four partners and you'll be joining, it'd be, you know, one-fifth. And in the past, there have been a lot of different buy-ins and something called a goodwill buy-in, which essentially was basically money that you'd give to the partners just out of goodwill or bad will, however you look at it, but just because they were allowing you to join them. And I think that those type of payments have sort of fallen off, but you will still have buy-ins for the assets of the practice. So that would be things like, the computers, the desks, the you know paintings on the wall, um, you know those things you'll have to pay a, a share of those costs in a depreciated value, and then the the bigger expenses will be things like the office building, or the condo, or the land, or the endoscopy center, and they will have values that could vary dramatically depending on you know the value of, of that property. One thing that really confused me when I was going through this job search process was how, how do I determine what I'm getting paid and how do I evaluate, you know, compensation one job to another. And I actually was looking at this slide last night when I was doing the talk and thinking this slide's very confusing and not very helpful. But I think overall the, the best way to think about compensation is sort of if you look at the money that you generate by doing your office visits and your consults and your procedures. Um, if you look at what you collect from the insurance company in a year, so you know you take whatever that number is and then you subtract your expenses, the difference there is really your, your compensation. And so I've listed several things that you might not think of as compensation, but they, they really are. So in a salaried, let's say, academic position or salaried to a hospital or multi-specialty group where you're salaried, you, you'll get X amount of dollars a year as a salary. And that's just what you'll get, you know, divided in weekly, monthly, bi-monthly payments. But then in addition, you'll have things that are either completely covered for you or partially covered, like disability insurance, health insurance, life insurance, and some type of a retirement payment. But in actuality, I mean, even in those salary positions, you're paying for those. So you may only pay $100 a week for health insurance, but the money that you bring in is actually paying the rest, even though you don't see it. So I think the best way to think about it is if you had each the number for the cost of everything and you added it up, those would be those total the total sum there would be your compensation you know, including salary, retirement benefits. So, you know, for us, for example, we don't have, you know, 401k with matching, but what we do is we put 52,000 a year, which is the maximum you can do, um, into, we have a profit sharing plan, but it's essentially sort of like an individual 401k. And so we set that aside for each of us, and that just comes out of the money I generate. It's not nearly enough to save each year for retirement, but it's like, it's a good start. Um, so. You know, I wouldn't necessarily count that as compensation in the sense it's not salary, but it's money that, that I'm putting into retirement on my own. So, you know, I, when you're looking at jobs, try not to just think about what the salary is going to be, but think about all those other benefits. I'll, another thing I found in the search for jobs is that certain things are better if you purchase them individually. So if you talk to an insurance agent or you talk to an attorney, you'll find that a lot of the group disability policies are not as robust as the individual ones. So the benefits may, you know, fade after time or it may not cover you for your own occupation. You know, for example, if you 
lost a few fingers and you couldn't do a colonoscopy. With my policy, I'd be completely disabled, even if I could do GI full time and still make money, but I'd still get full disability payments for the rest of my life. Whereas in some group practices, you don't get disability unless you're unable to work, you know, at all or in, you know, any capacity. So there's certain things that you don't necessarily think about um, as you're starting the process, but you, you'll learn as time goes on. Um, what are some of the other things that I, I think are important to think about private practice? Well, your colleagues are actually more important, I think, in private practice than in academia, because in an academic environment, your reputation is both, you know, individual, but also institutional. And in a private practice, it's individual, but also group. So even though you, you may sort of be your own independent doctor, if you're working with two guys who get investigated by the IRS and gets published in the papers, I mean, that sort of reflects on you. So you really need to like your colleagues in some way because they're going to be with you for a long time and you're going to be business partners with them as well. You also want to think about how call is distributed. You'd think that in most places call is distributed equitably among everyone, but that's not always true. I mean, there's some groups where people age out of call. There's some groups where the young people have to do the holidays. And so it just, it, it may not matter, but you want to think about that. Do you get to control your schedule? I mean, it, in private practice, I think a big advantage is I get to control my own schedule, but not in every group because, you know, there's only certain blocks of endoscopy time or office time. So you may be sort of forced into some of the less optimal time slots in the beginning. You, you want to think about other things like the office manager, you know, what kind of electronic records they have. I, I don't think those are as critical, but they will affect your quality of life. So you know, overall, I think what my experience was is that I knew that for me, I really wanted a job where I could feel fulfilled doing a phenomenal job, providing great care to patients, but also when I look back in 30 years, and I wanted to be able to say I was the best father I could be, the best husband I could be, and you know that was equally, if not more important to me. So for me, I, that led me in the path of private practice. I knew I needed money. I knew I wanted the flexibility to spend time with my kids. And so through my job search, I decided, all right, well, any private practice job, I'll make more money than the academic world. So the money wasn't as important in private practice as was the lifestyle. So I, you know, I was looking for practices that had coverage for only one hospital. And I didn't want a huge hospital with 300 beds. I mean, I wanted something where call would be very manageable. I wouldn't be running back and forth between two hospitals 20 minutes apart. Uh, so my practice, we have four doctors. We don't have any mid-levels. We don't even have a nurse, which is, saves us money, but is, you know, is painful at times. Um, we have one small community hospital, and we cover that. We don't do any admissions, so even for our own patients with liver disease, IBD, they're admitted by hospitalists, and, which is wonderful. And you can work as much or as little as you want. I chose to work four days a week um, and have sort of, you know, mostly a day off. We unfortunately don't have an endoscopy center, which would be a really nice thing to have. And I think that's one, one thing that I not regret because I love my job, but I wish that in Massachusetts we could build one. I love that I'm able to, you know, work in a town with a, a very short commute from where I live. We have a wonderful school system. And so, you know, that, that makes my life much better. You know, I can call my wife at 5.45 and say I'll be home at, you know, 6 o'clock and I'm always home at 6 o'clock. Um, typically, you know, days, our day is broken up, sort of like the academic uh, world when you're doing endoscopy and office, mostly half-day endoscopy, typically in the morning, and half-day in the office. Usually, I'll see a patient every half hour, which gives me time to just talk to patients if they're doing well, which is really something I enjoy, kind of getting to know patients and, um, you know, in private practice, you really uh, become established in the community and you get to know the community and it feels like family, which is, which is nice. And it also gives me a little leeway to squeeze in someone if they're, you know, someone needs an urgent visit. 
it, it sounds great. I mean, 7.30 to 5 o'clock, and, and I'm home by 6 every day. But, you know, I put in a lot of time before that. I get up at 5 every day, and I do work before my kids get up. And then I usually, my wife will go to bed, you know, 8.39, and I'll usually do an hour or two of work in, in bed at night. But that allows me to protect my mornings and evenings with, with my family. We do, um, we do a lot of consults in the hospital um, on our own patients, but then we also cover, you know, when we're on call, and we'll, you know, we'll cover for uninsured patients or other people's patients if they're away. Call is, for my group, is, is pretty easy. We're on call, as I said, three weeknights a month, one weekend a month, and it's, it's really minimal. I mean, I was surprised when I started in private practice. I thought it would be really painful to be on call, but it's really not bad. I mean, there's always the angst of carrying the beeper, but what I've grown to realize is that a weekend on call, for me at least, is really not, you know, not a big imposition. We still make plans, we do things. Typically go in for a couple of hours on a Saturday and maybe one to two hours on Sunday, see a few consults. Might get a couple of pages during the weekend, but that's it. Weeknights, I don't get paged by patients, really. They're, I don't know why, but that happens in fellowship all the time. <laughs> in, in private practice, I don't know. They just they don't call that much. And, uh, and it's, it's really not bad. Now, granted, there are weekends I've had that are much worse than that. But on average, it's great. I can go to the gym. I can go to my son's soccer game. Uh, we can go have a barbecue. And I don't worry about having to go into the hospital. So for me, I think I've found sort of a perfect balance of making enough money to live the lifestyle I want to live, to work, work hard, play hard, balance family time with really a fulfilling career. Would I, you know, would I love to just have two days a week of clinical practice and two days a week of teaching? Absolutely. But I wouldn't want to do all the research to get the grants to, you know, to support that time. So I realized I couldn't do it. But I'll tell you, it's very fulfilling to take care of people help people on an individual level. Um, it, there's just, there's nothing like it. So I, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I, I just wanted for uh, two minutes to mention a few things that I wish I had known when I was a fellow, you know, going into private practice, uh, especially in an academic fellowship. One thing that I was surprised about when I was on my own was how difficult it is to make a decision sometimes. And, you know, you feel like it's not that tough because in fellowship you have to make decisions all the time. But then what happens is you may not even realize it, but that decision gets validated by your attending. So even though you're making that decision and committing a patient to something, you're sort of getting a built-in second opinion. So all of a sudden when you're doing it on your own, it can be scary at times. So, you know, that I would just try to emphasize the importance of trying to make your decisions without talking to anyone, you know, and then hopefully people will confirm those decisions in, uh, you know, from, at the attending level. You also would really uh, find a, a huge benefit to doing as much continuity clinic as possible. You know, I found I did two GI clinics, I did a hepatology clinic, but a lot of the time I was seeing my preceptor's patients, so I never really you know, felt that I either, maybe I didn't take enough ownership, or maybe I just wasn't given enough ownership, or maybe a combination. But again, a lot of that clinical decision making that seems so easy when your attending is telling you, you know, what hepatitis treatment regimen to do, uh, you know, it just seems easy at the time. But in private practice, when you're doing it, you know, it's, it's a much different situation. Colonoscopy, I think if you go into private practice, you probably love endoscopy, which I do. And so I think the more endoscopy you do in training, the better. Um, you, it's, you really do get better with experience, and, and I think the studies show that as well. Communication, and I mean, everyone communicates, but get, in, get a system or get in the habit of communicating really well with the primary care doctors, because when you go into private practice or business, that's, that's your business. Your business is providing good care and communicating well with your, your network. Um, billing and coding, I didn't learn anything about in fellowship, uh, with the exception of maybe my last year from, from Sunil, from one, one guy who is very um, 
fixated on billing. And, uh, you know, he trained me how to document appropriately to bill, you know, level four. And I know I'm really over time, but I'll tell one quick story. So, you know, when I first started, I was billing everything level four because that's what I did as a fellow, you know, level four, level four, level four. It was so thorough, you know. Eight months into practice, boom, I got this letter from Blue Cross. We want 50 charts. We're auditing you. Oh, it took me a whole day to photocopy everything. I sent it in. I sweat. I, I, I didn't sleep. And I underbilled for the next six months before I, finally, before I finally got it back from Blue Cross. And they said, of the 48 charts I submitted, three should have been level five, and one should have been level three. So they said, you're fine. But, you know, so it was just, you know, so just it's good to learn billing because then you won't have to panic as much. All right. And that, that's it. And take questions at the end. But thank you very much.